Of course it takes a little more time to close down the roof than what you saw, but I will not bore you with the whole process in real time, because the average view of duration of this episode would drop. However, it's still a very convenient and quick solution, which I consider to be the best modification I could have done to this car. The way back led through the same canyon that you could see me driving in the dark in episode 5. This time, I could admire its beauty and I had an ambitious plan to show it to you from the perspective of a drone truck in the car, but unfortunately, the high walls made it hard to log into the satellites and the positioning of the drone was very difficult. Also, bright sun low over the horizon was fooling the sensors and the drone just didn't want to listen, so not too much came out of my plans. Nevertheless, these few shots give the opportunity to move back for a short moment to this place, which I consider one of the most charming during this trip. The road still runs along the dry riverbed of the Codulacisin River. There are no spectacular panoramas here, but the vertical walls cut into the white limestone, carved over millennia by the river that tried to reach the sea, make this place beautiful. Slope forms shaped by gravitational processes are ubiquitous throughout the Golgo Plateau and are represented by numerous collapses, rock rolls, debris flows, etc. The road is not particularly demanding, although it's quite winding and uneven at times, but in my opinion it would not be a problem for most popular cars. I'm not convinced that the sign I showed in the previous episode indicating a road only for 4x4 cars is justified here. But certainly, due to the constantly active gravitational processes, it can change from day to day. Despite the surrounding greenery, the cows that I encountered were proof that the living conditions here were difficult and the greenery does not mean that these poor creatures are abandoned in food. The ribs clearly drawn under the skin indicated that these animals were having a hard time here. The way back led me through the serpentines of Via San Pietro again. I head farther north, continuing on the SS-125, wanting to stay overnight somewhere near the last Via Ferrata that I planned to climb during that trip, Ferrata di Bada Pentumas. The road runs right at the foot of the vertical walls. In the distance you can see the Gulf of Orsay, with the town of Arbatax cutting into the bay. As historian Vittorio Angus wrote, Baunei is a village tied to a steep slope on the limestone ridge of Monte Santo, isolated in an isolated Ogliastra. The panoramic position overlooking the valley below makes the folk tale about its founding more credible. A Gothard created Baunei on the rocky elevation at an altitude of almost 500 meters to escape from the Arabs who were trying to invade in 1015. A big surprise for me was the stadium located at the northern end of the town. Despite the difficult terrain on which it is located, they managed to find a place for a 100 by 60 meters pitch. In 2020, the modernization took place, which cost 500,000 euros, and thanks to this, the Polisportiva Balnei club, existing here since 1967, got a very decent place for its games. As from 2008, the pitches on which professional leagues can be played must be 105 by 68 meters. Only the amateur league can play on this pitch, and this is where the club competing in the Prima Categoria belongs to. The seventh level of football games in Italy, organized by National Amateur League. The road is 100 kilometers of smooth asphalt. Just past Dorgali, I turn left northwest towards Nuoro. 
charging of the batteries was at a critical level and even a two-day stay in full sun did not recharge the main battery of the car to an acceptable level. It was my penultimate day in Sardinia and in the near future I had almost 1700 kilometers to get home and for that I needed them fully charged. So I decided to find a place to stay somewhere where I could connect to the mains and charge the batteries directly using the charger I have on board. I found a few accommodation proposals in my navigation, made some calls and chose Agritourism Costulu, one of the very few open places out of the high season. It took a few minutes to get to the property. The owners have a really impressive piece of land here. After a short conversation, mainly in sign language, because unfortunately the owner did not know English and I do not speak Italian, I plugged the charger into the socket and went to take a quick shower in cold water, as it was low season. Unfortunately, it turned out that charging through the management system of my three batteries was not possible. The device did not want to initiate the operation of transferring the current, restarting every now and then, which was shown by turning LEDs on and off. This would explain why even disconnecting the hotel battery from the alternator did not improve the charging of the remaining batteries. So I had to connect the charger directly to the main car battery. Again, it turned out that it makes sense to anticipate potential problems and be prepared in case they occur. In my window with recovery tools, I carry a 5 meter silicon booster cable. On one side it has a NATO plug and on the other an Anderson connector. As the Defender batteries are under the seat, I let the cables to the fender and thus have quick access to an external power supply. I can connect the alligator clamps to the Anderson connector if I want to connect to another battery or just connect to the charger, also connected via the Anderson connector to the hotel battery. So I plugged in the cable to the socket in the glove compartment on the fender. There are also compressor socket and winch remote control socket. I disconnected the Anderson connectors between the hotel battery and the charger. Let the cable from the fender into the car through the second gluing window and connected the charger directly to the car battery. As you can see, the system was stable this time. The car battery was almost completely discharged. The LED was not lit even next to the icon representing half charge status, let alone fully charged. The monitoring system indicated that the hotel battery was fully charged by the solar panel. And after switching to starter battery monitoring, I was pleased to finally see the correct level of its charging. A quick look at the installation I had to plug into. It was the most dangerous part of the job. Having the whole night of charging ahead, I calmed a bit as I was really afraid that I would run out of power on my way back home and focused on admiring the beautiful sun setting over the plateau. In the distance, there were the mountain peaks of Supramonte Limestone Range, with the highest peaks of Monte Corassi, 1463 meters above sea level. This is where I plan to go tomorrow. The immediate area was blushed from the rays breaking through the low layers of the atmosphere. You could feel moisture in the air, hence the scattering of the short waves was stronger and the sunset took on an intense orange color. Perfect evening to relax before the prelude that awaited me the next day and to make new friends. The morning was not as picturesque as the evening. 
The sky was overcast and the temperature was far from being perfect. As it was my last day on the island and I was still planning to climb a bit. Shortly after 10 am, I set off towards the range that I admired from a distance the previous evening. The road led first along the Nuoro bypass, then I passed Liena, then the SP46 headed towards Durgal. Next to the Su Cologne sign, turn right and follow the dirt road that leads to the Lanai Valley. Most guides recommend trekking from the Sa Oce hut, but with a 4x4 car you can drive a little closer to the Via Ferrata. And as it turned out, the approach was a bit more difficult than the one I remember from the descriptions I read. Okay, back on track. This time I'm looking for Ferrata Bade Pentumas. I have um, opened an Italian page uh, on the website with a description and I had the automatic translation to Polish which was showing some directions. But unfortunately, when I arrived here and there was no um, internet connection, I lost the translation. So the Italian is totally useless for me, unfortunately. So I'm trying, trying to follow a trail which is really um, somewhere in the, in the wild and, and there are barely marks visible. I'm not even sure if those are the marks leading to this ferrata or what is it, but sometimes, from time to time, you have, I show you this kind of um, red marks like here. Yeah, it's maybe this one is more visible. So when you go up, you can see the next one here. Uh, but as you can see, there's really no trail clearly visible, so I will try to follow them a bit and see where I get. Ciao! The rugged hills of Supramonte are famous for the intricate paths was known only to shepherds and coal traders. My ascent was through imposing limestone ridges that form sinkholes, canyons and aguilis. It's worth mentioning that Valle di Lanaito means the Valley of the Thick Wool. The name refers to the thick and impenetrable forest cover that initially covered the entire valley. Today it has undergone considerable thinning but nevertheless still retains its specific charm and mystery. Exploring this area up close is sometimes associated with unexpected accidents. Flying in tough conditions, unfortunately. It's not always successful. Let's see if that poor boy is still gonna work. Fortunately, the downfall didn't do much damage, apart from a few scrapes. Due to the erosion, the limestone of the high plateau is a typical karst formation. Lots of little drainage gullies crisscross the plateau and make hiking rather scrambling, quite difficult, and orientation as well. The eroded rocks form a surface with hard, extremely sharp edges, current formations. On one hand, it's relatively reliable support for the foot and it's difficult to slip. On the other, the gaps created by the water posed a real threat if a leg incidentally fell into them. Look how beautiful those formations are, just covered by water. Uh, they really sharp as a razor blade. You don't want to fall here because you have cut hand immediately. And um, look, they look pretty stable, but in fact, they are not so safe when you step on that, so you need to be careful. But that is spectacular, what water can do. Okay, keep going. Without Navi, it would be really difficult to find your way here. From a walker's perspective, there were no distinguished marks, no footprints, and as you can see, the Valle di Lanaito is quite large. Okay, so following those red dots, marks, 
whatever you call them. Seems like a good plan because they are appearing from time to time here. So definitely I'm following a trail. Just not sure if it leads me to the ferrata that I'm looking for or somewhere else, but I wouldn't like to stay here after dawn because they will be not visible at all and everything seems the same around. So just going back with the daylight is a must. All right. Finally, I got to what seemed to be the place I was looking for. Wanting to be 100% prepared for further attractions, I decided to put a helmet, harness and ferrata kit on. Armed like that, I added a few more minutes of walking to my hike, which was not easy given the width of the gaps between the individual limestone ridges forming vast hollows. If there were no ubiquitous holm oaks, one might think that I was on the moon. It was really hard to understand how people might once have lived here. And so, after more than an hour of walking, a huge chasm suddenly appeared. The deep Pentumas Gorge cuts the Supramonte limestone, presenting an unforgettable rock amphitheater. But the Pentumas is a dry canyon located in one of the most spectacular and wild corners of Supramonte di Olino, especially in the Sa Savana Valley, north of the Lanaito Valley. Supramonte is a wonderful region, but complex, archaic, raw and wild, offering unforgettable views and emotions. To be honest, it's difficult to describe such place in words. The Ferrata by the Pentumas runs in the majestic surrounding of the canyon along a series of ledges and traverses. This time, sending out the drone confirmed that this iron road exists and its security in the form of steel ropes was clearly visible on the rock ledges. I eagerly followed the western peak of the canyon in search of some descent into those corridors carved millions of years ago by the water. Unfortunately, to no avail. Okay, I really wanted to do it, but um, it's 2 p.m. I still got 200 kilometers to get uh, to the check-in for the ferry at 6.30, I believe. Uh, I think I will go back around one hour from here to get to my car. Uh, so I don't want to do it in a hurry. Those red marks are barely visible. I can see them in a lot of places. I started to wonder maybe they are like the blood marks or whatever of everyone that fell off. It's really, really um, dangerous, I would say. As you can see, there is no security lines anywhere. Sorry. Uh, just bare racks and really vertical walls. I think I'm not even close to the main passage that um, security lines should be. I believe they were visible from the drone. So I will just make one more footage from the drone and I will get back. So no ferrata climb this time. Hopefully the next one will be more successful. See you guys. An interesting fact I found out was that the origination of the canyon's name is not fully known. Pentumas probably comes from the pre-Roman suffix uma and the Latin pendere. This means an inaccessible gorge. From Pentumas comes the verb inspentumare, meaning to distract, disperse, remove or to make something go wrong. Hence, Pentuma is also the act of getting rid of the man's body by throwing it into the canyon after killing him, so it could not be found. So with this nice afterward, I end this journey in time. A journey to the moon, to the stone world, in which man is only a guest. Insignificant pollen, 
barely noticeable when it enters between huge walls so majestic that they seem unreal and untouched by a human foot. The environment is gigantic, wild, primitive, engaging, disturbing, capable of attracting with its colossal dimensions, offering an adventure that I can wholeheartedly advise if you are close by. And among these rock labyrinths, there are even more attractions to be discovered. I set off exactly at 3.30 p.m. on my way back to the port of Porto Torres. I had 167 kilometers to cover, which took me 2 hours and 40 minutes. From Nuoro, there is a nice asphalt road that it's hard to get lost on. Well, almost. After reaching the place, I saw the Urania ferry, this time painted in Batman and Joker. Exactly at 6.30 p.m. boarding started, and this is how my exploration of Sardinia, to which I will gladly come back one day, ends. Do you think I will sleep well in this noise? I don't think so. Let's try. Ciao.